In this uh, episode of the Turtis Pavlov Project, I want to talk about what I learned in a music conservatory that helped to make me a better scientist. Teachers of music in the public school sometimes justify uh, the music curriculum on the grounds that uh, students are learning skills that are going to be useful to them beyond the actual musical instrument or music lesson that they're taking, that there are some general skills to be learned uh, from studying music. This has been an issue of uh, considerable uh, debate and interest over the decades. And uh, I can assure you that having learned music at a conservatory, I think it has made me a better scientist. But uh, I would not, it would be absurd to advocate that all scientists should start out spending six years in a music conservatory. That doesn't work. <laughs> so what did I learn that has turned out to be useful? I'm going to talk about four things. First thing I want to talk about is an appreciation for the aesthetic dimensions of science. We usually don't think about science as having aesthetic dimensions. <laughs> we think about science as being highly technical, lots of numbers, a lot of specialized techniques and equipment and all of that sort of thing. And uh, frankly, sometimes that's not particularly beautiful, but it turns out science has an aesthetic component and the great scientists are highly aware of this and their work uh, is considered uh, prominent and uh, has a great impact in part because of, its, uh, of the aesthetic dimensions of their work. And there are two aspects of, of aesthetics in science. One has to do with uh, the quality of the organization of the ideas. Uh, we've all uh, been to uh, uh, conventions where people present talks on various uh, subjects, and some talks are beautiful, and some talks are just plain uh, old ugly. And uh, it's the beautiful talks that uh, have a greater impact. And there are ideas that have an aesthetic quality to, th to them uh, because of the nature of their organization and how they uh, address uh, a key question about nature. And, and there are models and theories and ideas that are not appealing, partly because they're kind of ugly. I mean, we uh, have a very famous, uh, uh, well-known uh, sort of point of progress in the history of science was when we abandoned a, a, a view of the solar system in which uh, the Earth was at the center of the solar system and we moved to a model where the sun is at the center of the solar system. That shift in how we think about the solar system didn't occur because it was impossible to create an Earth-centered model of uh, our solar system, but because all, as more data was coming in, maintaining an Earth-centered view of the solar system became so cumbersome and so ugly that people were <laughs> not willing to entertain it. And it all got beautifully simplified and much more elegant once you considered the possibility that it was the sun, in fact, around which the planets rotated. And uh, major theories have those kinds of properties. The theory of evolution has that property. In uh, uh, my own field, there's a prominent learning theory, the Scorla Wagner model, uh, which is still being seriously considered, and, and uh, it's taught in all uh, graduate learning courses. And there are lots of uh, current experiments that are stimulated by the model, even though there are a lot of data that are inconsistent with it, and the model has important shortcomings. Nevertheless, uh, we continue to entertain it, and we do so because it's, uh, it's a beautifully organized set of ideas. Aesthetics also has a great deal to do with scientific communication. B.F. Skinner was uh, highly cognizant of this. Uh, he spent a lot of effort in improving his writing so that he would be able to write beautifully. And some research reports 
are beautifully written. Others <laughs> are really ugly in, the, in how they're written. One point in my career, I established a, an award that I called the Poetry and Science Award, which was given to some uh, Peter Colleen uh, at the uh, Society for the Quantitative Analysis of Behavior a Convention in Big Ballroom. I <laughs> presented this award to Peter Colleen. The people in the audience were a little bit puzzled, but the point of the award was to recognize beautiful writing in science. If we did more of that, we would have more beautiful writing instead of all some pretty ugly stuff. So that's one thing I learned uh, at the Music Conservatory. Another thing I learned, uh, which has served me perhaps not so well, or has been a source of, uh, of a bit of disturbance over in my scientific career, is that if you're at a place like, uh, you know, a, a really elite uh, music conservatory, you learn a difference between what's really good, what's outstanding, versus what's really spectacular and, and genius. And uh, uh, we have a really hard time making that distinction. In science, there's a lot of self-promotion, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of hype in science. You, uh, if you, you watch scientific findings reported in the news, it's always, this may lead to a cure for cancer or heart disease or something else may lead to. <laughs> it's rarely, this is it, folks. We discovered the cure. It's, uh, uh, it, it, it's a step in the long progression of solving a health problem, but it's touted as a major discovery. And some of those are just normal science. They're not spectacular discoveries. They're just normal things that we find out in, in the course of doing experiments. In music, you, uh, you, you can't fake it. <laughs> you can't fake it. If you're if a violin and soloist is standing in front of an orchestra about to play Tchaikovsky's violin concerto, no amount of hype is going to get him through the performance. He either does a spectacular performance or he does kind of a workmanlike, good, okay performance, but not great. So in science, we spend a lot of time uh, trying to identify, you know, every institution has uh, aspirations to uh, have, a, you know, faculty that consists of the greatest people in uh, the world on this particular topic, and so they have to find who these great people are, but they have a trouble making the distinction between great and outstanding, and so they do things like count publications, the number of grants received, number of times the work is cited, da 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 da. And those things don't quite always capture. You can get lots of publications shooting. I knew somebody who was a really pedantic scientist who had hundreds of publications. It was pitiful. I mean, it, anyway. So that distinction is real hard to make. Uh, and as I say, uh, uh, being able to make that distinction and being aware of that distinction, I, I think makes you a better judge of uh, quality. And uh, as a scientist, you're often asked to judge quality. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the more you pay attention to that distinction, the harsher a critic you become, <laughs> which may not make you popular among your colleagues. So that was number two. The third thing uh, that is inescapable at a music conservatory is you have to practice a lot. I mean, we. Uh, my brother and I were together at, at, at Juilliard, and uh, he was a twin, and we both initially studied the violin. And uh, we spent five or six hours a day practicing. I mean, we, we had to go to high school, and we got, had an arrangement whereby we, uh, the high school allowed us to do half day so we could go home and practice. And, and we, in fact, you know, we didn't cheat on that. We went home, and we practiced five or six hours a day. So. Uh, uh, and there are skills that you, you learn in the process of learning to practice. And those skills are tremendously useful in a wide range of, of, uh, uh, of activities. The first thing that you learn is that in order to achieve something significant, it's going to take a lot of hard work. <laughs> and uh, there are people who don't accept that or haven't realized it or certainly haven't worked it into their program of daily activities. 
The second thing about practice is that it's really boring. <laughs> I mean, you're doing, playing, doing the same passage over and over again. And, and so uh, it's, it's a repetitive, boring activity. You have to monitor yourself if you're gonna su practice su successfully, so you become really good at self-monitoring. You become really good at repetitive, boring tasks. And the reason you, you put up with doing those repetitive, boring things is you get really good at connecting these boring, repetitive things that you have to do by yourself with success in the long range. With success a month down the road, uh, two months, six months down the road. If you have a concert scheduled six months out, you have to prepare a, a concerto. Uh, you get good at uh, connecting your daily routine to goals that are not going to be realized until months and sometimes years down the road. Well, it turns out you have to do exactly the same thing in science. If I look back on what are the things that I spent most of my time doing as a scientist, it's reading and writing. <laughs> People ask me, what do you do for a living? Well, I do a lot of reading and writing. I do a little, a little bit of arithmetic, but mostly reading and writing. You have to read a lot of stuff, and you have to write a lot of stuff. Initially, you have to write articles, and then book chapters, and books, and so on, on and on and on. And writing is, is basically a solitary activity. It's pretty boring. It involves a lot of self-monitoring, and it, in, it involves a lot of work where the outcome is not evident until pretty far in the future. You have to write grant proposals that are not gonna be funded for six or nine months. You write books that may not appear on a shelf, may not be uh, uh, in the bookstores to two or three years down the road and so on. So you get really good at doing that kind of thing. The last thing I, I, I wanna uh, talk about is that uh, one of the critical things about music is interpretation. Uh, musicians are creative artists, even if they play music written by other people. You have to bring the notes on the page to life, and you bring them to life by how you interpret those notes. Turns out, you do pretty much the same thing in science. The basic notes of science are data points. They're observations of nature. They're data points you collect in your own laboratory or you find in the literature and so on. But the data points themselves don't make music. They don't, they don't tell a story. You have to create a story based on those data points. And so interpretation is a very important part of science, just as it is in the performing arts. And that, w that became obvious to me very early on. I mean, the Tertus Pavlov project is the scientist in the pair is Pavlov. And we attribute uh, or we credit Pavlov with the discovery of uh, salivary conditioning. That's what made him famous. Well, no, not really. Turns out, the basic phenomenon of salivary conditioning was well known in Pavlov's laboratory for years before he started doing research on it. Uh, they were doing lots of studies of digestive physiology, which involved measurements of uh, salivary uh, composition, the, chemistry, chem the chemical composition of saliva, and the conditions under which saliva is secreted, and how much of it is secreted, and how viscous and, uh, and other sort of properties of saliva. They, were, they did the same thing with stomach juices and so on. And during the course of those experiments, they did, the technicians, not Pavlov, but the technicians and students working in the lab, noticed, noticed that some of these dogs were salivating before you actually introduced the, the stimulus meat powder that would ordinarily trigger the salivary reflex. So uh, Pavlov didn't discover conditioned salivation. What Pavlov discovered was the significance of it. It's the interpretation he put on this phenomenon that made him the great scientist and the great contributor to our understanding of le basic learning processes that he was. 
uh, he recognized that this uh, type of uh, anticipatory salivation can tell us a great deal about how we learn associations and how the nervous system is modified by these kinds of learning experiences. So that was his, his discovery. It was not the discovery that dogs will salivate when you ring a bell. So interpretation is really important. And uh, eventually, great scientists, great scientists know all these things. They know about aesthetics. They know the importance of, of, uh, of beautiful communication. They know the importance of, of doing a lot of solitary. They do a lot of self-monitoring. I mean, B.F. Skinner used to keep track of how many pages a day he wrote in order to make sure that he kept up a reasonable pace. So they do a lot of self-monitoring. They do a lot of uh, long-range planning. And they spend a lot of time worrying about how to interpret those notes. So in closing today, I'm going to play uh, a piece called the Chardash, which is a Hungarian uh, folk melody. It's kind of a gypsy uh, tune, if you will. It was not written for the viola. I don't think it's written for the viola. It's written for the uh, violin. And uh, it was, it was, this is a version that uh, uh, Monty kind of uh, put together for the violin, but I'm talking about interpretation. I'm going to take out a lot of liberties in how I interpret the notes that uh, Monty put on the page here. Uh, take a lot of liberties in tempo, uh, a lot of in bowings, in what part of the instrument I play a particular tune, and of course, instead of playing it on the violin, I'm going to play it on the viola. So there's a lot of interpretation that goes into it. Hope you'll, you'll enjoy it. Mm -hmm. 